Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. And God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. Welcome to another edition of the Q Podcast. I'm Gabe Lyons, and I hope your summer is getting off to a good start. And I'm so glad that you're taking time to join with us today, because I think we're talking about a topic today that's so important, and it's become more important now that we've walked through a pandemic together. And it's the idea of neighborhoods. It's the idea of being good neighbors. And what does that look like? And as you're going to hear in this interview with Dr. Tony Cook, who's the executive director of the Hopeful Neighborhood Project, there has been so much revealed to us about how we think about neighborhoods, specifically over the last few months, when our world has become so small and we've been forced to better understand our local neighborhood, our community, who we interact with, how often do we interact with them, do we know their names? And so today we're going to talk more about that. But before we get into that interview, I want to remind you that this is coming out of a conversation we had during our Q2020 virtual summit, where we had over 40 different talks and presentations that took place all related to what does it mean to be faithful in a world now that's starting to change significantly. Some of these talks related specifically to COVID-19 and the developments that have come as a result of that, and then others relate specifically to the cultural issues, current issues, the news of the day, and how we as Christian leaders can move forward and be faithful. And so it's available to you if you didn't get to participate with us live, as over 10,000 people did, I want to make sure you have the advantage of going back and seeing those talks, watching those sessions, taking advantage of what we have to offer. And so you can do that at qideas.org slash 2020. And when you sign up for the whole virtual summit, it's only $96. And when you do that, you're actually going to also receive a one-year subscription to Q Media. And when you get that Q Media subscription, that means you're able to watch not only those old talks that have we've been doing over the last decade, but you get to see the entire summit. You get to see our ongoing original programming, our Q conversations. You get access to the Q dinner topics and conversations and questions, also to films and short films and documentaries and series. There is so much there for you right now. We've heard from so many of our subscribers who've just said, thank you. The timing has been perfect. We're home with our families. We're looking for conversation starters that we can have with our kids, with our friends, with our family members, and Q has completely hit the mark. And so I hope you'll enjoy that. It's a $96 purchase. It gives you access to the entire summit, one year of programming. And if you don't want the summit, you can just so subscribe monthly. It's $7.99 a month, and you can enjoy everything that we have to offer on Q Media. And so I hope you'll do that. But for now, I want us to listen in to Dr. Tony Cook, Executive Director of the Hopeful Neighborhood Project. And we're going to talk all about neighborhoods, what it means to understand our neighbors, what it means to imagine the future with our neighborhoods, what it means to build on the strengths of our neighborhoods, not just focus on the weaknesses. And so let's listen in now to this conversation. Well, Tony, it is so great to get to be with you on the Q Podcast and have this conversation today. Yeah. Oh, I'm uh, thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. And listen, I thought our conversation we got to do at the virtual summit was such a great setup to better understanding the needs for us to be thinking about neighborhoods. And, And I know you and I have known each other uh, for many years. And when we were talking a year ago about the need for the work that you're doing right now through the Hopeful Neighborhood Project, I don't think we could have foreseen the nature of how urgent that was going to become, right? I mean, we no. <laughs> we knew there were problems in our society. We knew some relationships were breaking down. We knew the church didn't always have the best approach in, in some cases to understanding the need of their neighbor. Uh, but man, we didn't know a pandemic was coming. No, no, not not at all. Um, and it completely, it was a game changer. I know it was for you uh, yeah. and, uh, and for your, your, your workshop, but uh, for how we thought about this project and the importance of this project, uh, when we were all in our homes and uh, we became intimately aware of our neighbors around us, it really, uh, it really made us ask the question, are we thinking about the right things? Are we focusing on, and, and really, what can we learn that's been one of my big things is is what can we take away from what we learned about neighborhoods uh, from the pandemic? Right, because this was the test. I mean, this yeah. has been the test that 
you never could have prescripted or made happen. I mean, you could have done a bunch of research and I know you've done a ton of research and you've partnered with Barna and David Kinnaman for your upcoming book and a big research project that I think everybody listening is going to enjoy hearing more about, but you couldn't have created a research project like what we've just gone through over these last few months where you're at home, you're not really able to go many places. You either know your neighbors or you don't. Mm -hmm. You're now in a situation where it's hard to actually get to know people if you didn't already know them because everybody's a little skeptical. They're wearing masks. They're not so sure they want you to even come to the front door. Yeah. Uh, and so I think you're right. I think it was a good assessment where everybody just stopped for a minute and went, wait, am I being a good neighbor? Do I even know my neighbors? Do I even know how to get in touch with my neighbors if I can't walk over to their house? Do I have their phone number? And so I think it's been a bit of a reckoning, right, to, to go and reevaluate how well am I doing? And and so curious, just from your perspective, I mean, as you look at this test, what do you think are some of the things it's revealing for people as they stop and reflect on their neighborhood? Yeah, I think what one of the things that stood out to me was um, when things are going well, you know, when you don't have a pandemic, you really don't think about the interdependence that you have with your neighbors. Um, because we can all go do our own thing, right? We can go to the grocery store, we can you know, um, go to work, things like that. But one of the things that you started to immediately realize is that when your world shrinks <laughs> as small as it did all the way down to the footprint of your home, that the reliance that we have on the people that are immediately around us, that was just uncovered. And, um, like one of my friends, uh, Drew, he uh, went around and um, put a sheet on everybody's door that had his his phone number and his email address in case people needed something. And um, good idea. he got to know, you know, neighbors through that. And I don't think that we realize, you know, I, I have I live in a very small house in the city, and I can stand between my house and my neighbor's house and stretch out my arms and touch our two homes. So I'm living less than, you know, probably. 10 feet um, uh, away from my neighbor, but do I really know what she needs on a daily basis? And, and during this time, we got a little bolder, and we were able to reach out, talk to each other on the porch. People were using uh, platforms like, I think it was called Nextdoor, and posting needs that they have or saying, you know, I found some toilet paper or <laughs> I found some disinfectant. Does anybody need it? And so I really believe that when we kind of pull away the the luxuries that we have of of commerce and capitalism and uh, our ability just to order you know and drive and pick anything we want up uh, from the store, we realize that as human beings we're really designed to to work in a very interdependent way, and that was one of the things that that popped out. The, another thing that happened just um, this last week, my wife and I walk around the block, and since we're not in a car we decided to go down streets that we would never go down because they're not cut throughs, you know? Um, so we were walking around and seeing these homes we didn't even know were there. And when we were um, coming around the corner, coming back home, there were these two brick houses. They both had uh, front porches. And these families were sitting on their front porches. The kids were playing on the front porch. And the, the parents were talking across um, the connecting yard to each other on the front porch. And I don't think I had seen that in the six years that I've lived here in the city. You know, and it reminded me of the late 70s when I was a kid, where in the summertime, like we didn't have air conditioning. So, you know, so we'd sit outside and you talk to your neighbors and and you got to know who they were, what they did, what their needs were. So in many ways, it was kind of a flashback to, you know, I'm old. So the good old days no, were simpler it, times. <laughs> it really, no, it really did feel yeah. like that, and it it does feel like that. That it's, it does. Yeah, world, and I thought I thought that was a great point you made. Your world has shrunk now. Yeah, you can't get on. And a there's plane. some things we shouldn't lose. You yeah, know, right? Um, out of this, there there are blessings and remembrances that come out of this pandemic that I think we really should hold on to. Yeah, and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. I think for for me, it has been a realization of a world that has shrunk. Who is your community? Do you have community? I know in your life, you travel a lot. I travel a lot. I have lots of relationships around the country and some around the world, but who is my local community? Who are my closest friends? Who is there to meet my needs? Whose needs can I be meeting? It started to force those questions. And I'm curious, since you've been studying neighborhoods so much and, and really the development of neighborhoods, why they exist, how they function, 
could you just give a little bit of more of a definition on on a neighborhood because you know we hear you know the one of our key commands from Christ is to love our neighbor as ourselves and you hear that word neighbor you know these days in a global society it's like my neighbor can live in China right but but what does it really mean what's the idea of the neighborhood how do you kind of frame up what a neighbor is, what a neighborhood is, as we go a little deeper here into what you've been learning about the importance of neighborhoods? It's a very interesting question because um, while we've been doing this program, many people ask that uh, because they have different views of what their neighborhood is. For us, we take um, a very hyper-local approach to neighborhood. In some of the community development literature, they try to find ways of framing it by geography sometimes. But um, the, the one quote that I like to pick up on is one gentleman said that uh, you start where you put your pillow. <laughs> and um, so where you put your pillow, and then you expand out from there. Um, for us, a neighborhood is um, a geographic location in which you have daily interactions with others. And so like I drive, you know, 20 minutes to work and I interact with people there. But what I'm looking at is the, um, from my home, kind of out in concentric circles, who are the people that I interact with um, on that hyper-local level? And there is no one definition, oddly enough, for a neighborhood. Uh, If you look at the United States and how we do our demographics, while some uh, states in cities like St. Louis, St. Louis is made up of neighborhoods, I was doing air quotes there for you, um, neighborhoods that they define, There is no universal definition. So uh, people kind of have a sense of, am I in my neighborhood? You kind of feel like when you've walked beyond your neighborhood. And what we found is that that sense of that feeling is that when you have walked beyond the places that you normally go for the things you need. So you you could view your colleagues at work as your neighbors. I mean, technically in that definition where it's like your your kind of realm of relationships at church. Yeah, it, it, it's not just the physical location of my home. Is Because I know when we lived in Manhattan, we would sort of look, and, and I don't know if this was from the Catholics, but the, this parish idea was essentially six blocks. It was, it was a physical six-block radius from the location of your church. That was kind of the parish that that you should be thinking about, and you should know everybody in that six block radius. You know, this is your zone to do ministry, and there's something simple about that because you can kind of put a boundary around it and go, "This is my world. I need to go deeper." I think in suburban life that gets a little different because you're in the car, you're driving to work, you're driving to church, you're not always walking, and so I think it's actually helpful to hear you describe it. That if you were to just kind of take account of who are my relationships on a daily basis, a weekly basis. That I'm interacting with and start to see them as my neighbors. That's 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 really helpful. Well, we find that um, community development is um, extremely relational. So a lot of times people look at community development as being programmatic. So you get a grant, you you know you have a program, you execute that program, and then you move on to the next grant. But while doing things, those activities are important for the well-being of a neighborhood. Just developing those relationships is one of the strongest and quickest ways of deepening well-being in a neighborhood. So uh, as inherently social beings, (laughs) uh, those relationships are important. So I tell people that if you you go through uh, training and you meet with five or six people um, that you interact with in your neighborhood, and you never actually execute a project— that you've actually deepened your neighborhood simply by deepening those relationships. So relationships are key. We do have the, you know, um, where you put your pillow kind of model, but then we continue to expand it out. For us, normally, the widest boundary that we think that our project works in starts at your home and then probably goes as large as your zip code. And the reason we use the zip code, and I didn't know this uh, for a long time, was that research says that your zip code can be a predictor of health and well-being even more than your DNA. And um, I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense, you know, when I first heard that. And I started to study it, and I realized that there are environmental factors, economic factors, uh, relational factors, you know, um, being in a food desert, for example, um, downtown, 
or living across in Illinois, where I lived at one time, um, where the town was uh, centered around a steel mill that had uh, a lot of pollution back then. And uh, children developed asthma, had uh, like three times the rate of asthma of kids in the surrounding areas. And you realize that, you know, we're creatures of of place and embodiment. And where we live, we live there holistically, <laughs> our spirit, our, our mind, but also our body. And so um, zip code is a very important thing because it helps you kind of understand those environmental influences. And it was it was fascinating because when they were talking about the pandemic, there was a guy on uh, the morning news that was talking about how they were starting to look at the spread of, of uh, COVID-19 and categorizing it by these zip code regions of states. And they realized that within these regions that there was different spread rates that were going on. So it was just, that's something I learned that I thought, wow, that, that's kind of interesting. Then what we do is if you get beyond your zip code, we encourage you to link up with another group in, in that zip code that you're working with and that you partner together. I, I think the technicalities of starting to understand neighborhoods, people are going to be more and more interested. I think local leadership's becoming really clear. I mean, you, we talk, you know, about, you, you know, you're, I'm located in Franklin, Tennessee in Williamson County. You, what, what county are you in? Uh, Saint, I'm in the city, St. Louis City. Yeah, so yeah. you're in the city of St. Louis. And so your local leadership is defining what your life looks like right now in a way exactly. that my local leadership's <laughs> defining it a little bit differently. You know, we we opened up weeks ago. We've we've been moving a lot more. You know, our governor has different rules than your governor. And you start to realize how much, you know, for a season, I feel like for decades, it's been like the president, that leadership, that's what really matters. Maybe your congressmen and senators, people don't necessarily pay as much attention to the local elections, to their mayor, to whoever they're putting in these leadership positions. And you now realize that, wow, those are the most important elections. That's going to affect my life way more than things at the federal level. And so I think there's going to be a renewed energy towards going, what does it mean to truly be a good neighbor? What does it mean to be local? What does it mean to serve the community? What does it mean to be more engaged and aware? And that that does feel like a little bit more of an old American kind of world. Uh, but I I think this this moment is going to kind of draw our attention back to that. And, and I wonder, Tony, you know, one of the great projects that you've been working on and you worked on with David Kinnaman and the Barna team uh, was a project that that now is a beautiful monograph called Better Together. Uh, I've loved it. I've loved just being able to to look at the data. I love looking at the data and trying to better understand what's going on. And, and the subtitle for it's called How Christians Can Be a Welcome Influence in Their Neighborhood. I, I wonder if you just give us a couple for you, like, insights that in this project, all this data as you started to realize the way neighbors are thinking about the church, how Christians are thinking about their neighbors, like give us a couple of those just key high-level insights for you that would be helpful for leaders who are listening right now and wondering, how can I be a better neighbor? What, what is it that I need to be doing right now to be faithful in my community? Uh, some of the insights that, that pop out to me uh, kind of immediately, uh, the first one would be motivation. Um, many times we think people might have a um, a cynical motivation, you know, or a, a self-centered motivation for for the things that they do within their community. But uh, one of the statistics that we found in the research was that the practicing Christians that we interviewed were very they were very generous in their motivation, and that sixty eight percent of the practicing Christians, their primary motivation was to help someone else. So it wasn't, what can I get out of this involvement? But it was really giving back to the community and giving to others. So as a, as a pastor, you know, motivation is, is key, um, and not only in what we do, but in how we think about our, our members. And so the first thing that, that I think is really positive is that the members of our congregation, by and large— they have a good heart, <laughs> and and they they have this desire and this motivation to use their gifts, to be generous, and to kind of um, pay it forward and, and to pass it on and to be helpful. So one encouragement is that's a huge thing. I mean, you already have one of the biggest things going for you, and that is a positive motivation. If you've done any type of adult education, you realize that adult education, you make or break it based off of the student's motivation. If they're not motivated, if they're not interested, they just simply don't perform, they, they don't participate. But here, 
you know, 68% having this motivation of being generous and helping others, I think is key. Um, one of the other key things that came out was not only do Christians have this positive motivation, but pastors, the heart of pastors tells us that they want their people to live out their vocation in their daily life. And, and that's such a, an important piece. I, I was a pastor for a number of years, and, and anyone who's been around a church, I, I think, feels that a lot of times Christianity can be um, reduced down to worship. It can be reduced down to campus activities that we go to. And every pastor, when he preaches a sermon and, and he's teaching class, you know, and when we're praying, uh, we think, you know, Lord, just kind of set these people's hearts on fire to, to live as Christ in their community. And what we found is that the majority of pastors that we interviewed and surveyed, that's what they wanted. Um, they, they wanted to do that. The thing they were missing from the survey was they didn't know how to disciple their people in order to do it. They didn't know what to teach them or, or what skills that they can be needed. In, I mean, that can be intimidating for a pastor when you're trying to really equip leaders in your church who might have very different skill sets. They're working in very different types of environments. And I know some pastors kind of shrink back because they go, I don't have experience in that area. I don't, I don't know how to help you do better at the work you've been called to do if you're in the fashion industry or maybe you're working as an entrepreneur. Uh, and what we've always tried to encourage people, the, the pastors to do is go spend a day with them at work. Go have lunch on site, wherever they're at, sit in with them for a couple hours and just better get to know what their life's like, what their work's like, what are the decisions they're trying to make, what what are they learning about the community. And you'll be amazed at how much, as a pastor, number one, you can learn, but, but number two, you start to see opportunities to maybe help them think and imagine different ways in which the gospel can kind of intersect their work. I would say for pastors listening, take advantage of going on some field trips. I think that can be a fun way to... Uh, Live their daily lives faithfully. Yeah, you well, know? And, and I'm glad to see you know, that the data was producing this because, um, you know, one of the concerns 20 years ago, I would say a lot of a lot of pastors, if we were to look at kind of basic Christian theology around caring about the community, there was this tie to it that was around evangelism. It was, I will do something good in my community if it can lead to a presentation of the gospel that's really clear, that people can make decisions for Christ, and they can convert to Christianity. And I would say, of course, we want people to convert to Christianity. We want to be taking the gospel into our neighborhoods. But the motivation was very linked to that. And, and there's been a growth, I think, in just bigger theological understanding that it actually glorifies God when we do good with our neighbors, even if they don't convert, even if they're not given a specific opportunity in that moment to hear a presentation of the gospel. He is still honored by that. Uh, and so I, I feel like we've seen the church move forward in understanding the both and of this that John Stott used to talk about. He used to talk about good works and evangelism as like the perfect dance partners. I don't know if you've ever heard this, yeah. this quote. Yeah, but I've he, heard that, yeah. Yeah, he's like, they're the perfect dance partners. You need them both, but it's not a 50-50 relationship. It's like a good marriage. It's like 100%. We give 100% to good works. We give 100% to evangelism. You don't have to try to parse this out. Uh, and when you do all of that, you're presenting this beautiful picture of the gospel that people are drawn to. Uh, and, I, and I think, man, the reemergence of that kind of thinking and that kind of discipleship should energize pastors and energize churches to know we can make a difference, and this honors God when we try to make our communities better and we try to make our neighborhoods better. Yep. Amen. Well, Tony, I, I know that you have been working on the manuscript for a project that will come out in spring of 2021 called the Hopeful Neighborhood Field Guide. And I wonder if you could give us a little preview here of some of what you're learning, because one of your gifts is synthesizing. I mean, you've taken in a lot of information. You're, you're somebody who I know is introverted. You love to read and consume <laughs> data. But one of the gifts when you do that sort of thing is when you can actually help synthesize for the rest of us. <laughs> what do we need to know? And I think your field guide does that. And you, even your subtitle for it is going to be Six Lessons on Pursuing the Common Good right where you live. And I wonder if you could give us a couple of those. Don't You don't have to give it all away, but what, what are a couple of those lessons that in 2020 right now, we could really start to apply if we understood the ways in which we could advance the common good in our community? Sure. Um, I, I think probably the, the most foundational one is that our approach being focused on what's strong in your community instead of what's wrong in your community that um, this type of imaginative possibilities for your neighborhood and focusing on what's possible with the gifts that you have 
is such a game changer. I mean, it, it's been the core of asset-based community development for years. And it helps liberate us from uh, what might be kind of an automatic way of thinking, kind of our, our knee-jerk response of, I look around and I see all the problems, and and half the time those problems are people, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so people become a problem, and if they would just pick up their garbage or move their car, you know, kind of thing. But uh, this approach, we want to focus on those kind of God-given gifts. And first and foremost, we believe that your neighbor is a gift and that you are a gift to your neighbor. So it's a very um, uh, first article, if you will, creation focus that each and every one of us are given to this world for each other. So if we put all of our resources together in our neighborhood, what possibilities could we dream about? And that is a complete game changer when you start to work on community development. If you're always taking a problem-based approach, um, you're, you're always kind of falling into this uh, fixing problems and fixing people. Yeah. What great advice to anybody engaging, trying to engage anything collaboratively is how much promise and possibility comes when we can start to imagine and start to see traction somewhere that we could build on versus you're right. I mean, think about how easy it is to just come together when there's a problem. And that that doesn't give shared vision. Many times it's it's us just complaining, critiquing, like you said, focusing on if we could just solve this person's problem, everything would be better. And and that doesn't lead to the kind of lasting flourishing that I know you're describing here. No. I mean, people are fascinating. I I love, even as an introvert, I, I love the uniquenesses of individuals. And I'm always surprised when I've known someone uh, for a number of years, and all of a sudden I realize th- that they're so gifted in, in a number of areas. And if we just took the time to to talk to each other and to share those things, I think that our eyes would be opened, our imagination would be stimulated so that we could envision a deepening of that well-being and and we could see great things come out of that. So that's one thing. Uh, Another thing is um, that it's very, very important, and you you spoke to this a little bit, um, it's very important that people value the uniquenesses of their particular neighborhood. There is there doesn't exist one program that works for every context. So, you know, I, I grew up in a town of 600 um, uh, farmers uh, in the Midwest. Now, that's very, very different than living here in the city or, you know, um, living in a high rise in Manhattan. Each one of those neighborhoods are unique. They have um, different assets that are there. They have different strengths. They have uh, uh, different uh, community assets that are available, institutional as well as infrastructural. So it, it, it's like we're given a box of Legos, <laughs> and and each box is a unique collection for each community. And you have to stare into that box of Legos and say, okay, now I'm not going to worry about what Legos this other community has, but what do we have and what can we build out of it? And you might realize that your your neighborhood is primed to jump right in. You might realize that your neighborhood has suffered uh, severe trauma and that before you can move forward, you have to build trust, you know, um, and uh, uh, get to know each other and and have some healing before that can happen. Or you might realize that you have whole pockets of giftedness that have been completely overlooked because they don't fit into um, uh, maybe the the commerce that goes on in that community or, um, uh, you know, kind of other political structures that are there. So every neighborhood, like every person, is unique. And to me, the beauty of this uh, of this approach is that the possibilities kind of emerge when you're collaboratively working together, being positive, and then assembling those unique pieces of your particular community into something beautiful. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Tony, I'm so grateful for your work, and people who are listening can learn so much more about this uh, through the Hopeful Neighborhood Project. Will you just describe a little bit about where you see this going? I mean, this isn't just about one research project or about a book. This is about a much bigger vision for the church and for Christians to better engage this for many, many years to come. And so I want people to get familiar with you, and I I want them to better understand where they can just go direct to what you're doing and what your work is doing. So talk a little bit about the Hopeful Neighborhood Project overall, kind of the macro idea. Yeah, the the Hopeful Neighborhood Project is um, an online network, if you will, 
that has a uh, training on it. Um, the books are, are part of that training, but also it's a place to share best practices, to um, read articles and stories from people who are uh, pursuing the common good uh, right where they live. And um, it is a form of kind of social learning. <laughs> it's one thing to learn on your own, but the power of, of learning as, as human beings is that when we share that learning with one another. So it's not like we're sitting in an ivory tower kind of telling you, you know, all the answers, but we're creating um, this collaboration in the same way that we know it needs to happen in a, in a neighborhood. We know that it needs to happen um, in, in our network as well. So um, the Hopeful Neighborhood Project, hopefulneighborhood.org, is kind of our landing page, if you will, for uh, all of the efforts that uh, that we're doing. And there'll be the um, uh, links to the different books and stuff that we write, but also uh, a number of um, uh, blogs and free resources. We're creating the ability to create on the website um, neighborhood groups so that you can um, talk online with people in your neighborhood as well as we're working uh, with Barna and with Glue, uh, a new partner that we're working with, to launch um, a revision of our Every Gift survey, which is a, a giftedness survey. And um, there are a lot of giftedness surveys out there, but this one is designed specifically to look for the giftedness that can be uh, utilized as, as gifts and assets to um, deepen the well-being in a neighborhood. So you can take that. Uh, you can see the giftedness around you. Uh, we'll be able to represent on a map um, and by zip code the gifts that are there and uh, create kind of a, a national gift exchange, if you will, <laughs> where people can uh, share and, and find those gifts. And then uh, we're expanding it also internationally. Um, we've done work internationally in about 34 places around the world. And so um, we're beginning to take this idea and uh, and roll it out there to see what we can learn. Interestingly enough, many international places uh, where we work already function a lot like this. The, the interdependence is still there. The, the neighborhood uh, mindset is still there. And so we're essentially offering an invitation to come walk along with us, to, to learn with us, to give your experience and your input into it as well. So it's online network with resources and... Um, surveys that you can figure out more about yourself in your own neighborhood. Well, Tony, thank you for your good work on this. I know you've spent years building for us to better understand this. And I know around the Q community, you're going to be here for a while, just helping helping us navigate what the future of neighborhoods look like, what we're learning from this pandemic season, how we're going to be as churches in the future able to serve more. I know one of my favorite talks as well at our Q event was one on community gardens, where we had a uh, gentlemen share about how churches are now starting to create community gardens. They were already doing that, but during this pandemic, how much more important that's becoming as a way to get to know neighbors, work together, get their hands dirty together, take advantage of a bunch of land and space that many of our church buildings have that's being underutilized or they're just paying to mow it. And instead mm -hmm. they should be planting seeds and growing <laughs> vegetables. You know, I just thought, yeah, this, this is what it means to start thinking local again. This is what it means to start working alongside our neighbors. So thank you for, for all that you're leading, and we'll look forward to continue to see more that comes from this project. Yeah, I love the partnership. Not to quote the title of the of the monograph, but it, it is true. We are, we are better together. Yeah. Thank you. I know we're better for having heard from you today and at our Q Summit. So thank you for being a part of this, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing what more is to come. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this conversation with Tony, and he will be around with us for a long time, helping us better navigate what it means to be great neighbors. But you can learn more about everything that he just talked about at hopefulneighborhood.org. So check that out. And also a reminder, you can watch my interview with Tony that I actually did at the virtual summit. You can also get talks from Tim Keller, Ann Boskamp, Francis Chan, Priscilla Shire, so many more leaders who are a part of the virtual summit. It's still available to you when you subscribe to Q Media at qideas.org slash 2020. You not only get all of those talks, you also get hundreds of other talks from our previous gatherings and events and sessions and interviews and conversations. And you're also going to get the benefit of our curation. And that's one of the things that we value at Q. We know you're busy. We know that you've got so much information, content, podcast episodes. Everybody's telling you, you should listen to this. You should listen to that. It's hard to sometimes know where to start. And so our team takes an extra amount of time 
to better understand what do we think a Christian leader who's trying to be thoughtful about the world today, who wants to navigate it with faithfulness, what do we think they would benefit from hearing? How would they grow more? What kind of experiences can we create around the dinner table for them with their families so that they can have conversations that are substantive and that actually matter for the future? And so you can learn more about Q Media by going to qideas.org slash 2020. I hope you'll join in with that community of thousands who are participating with us on a weekly basis on learning and conversation. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week.